Hello. So you're all here, hopefully, for uh, Hilton 201. This is uh, software fan fiction. I'm not exactly certain the title was something like jailbreaking iPhone mobile fan fiction or fan fiction for mobile or something like that. My name is Jay Freeman, um, but most people online know me as Sorek. So I'm going to do a quick introduction of who I am. So if you don't know why I'm here, um, hopefully you'll know by the end of that. So I'm Sorek, and uh, a couple points to make on, on me being Sorek is, is that I am not Spock's father. I, I, I don't have to say this to this audience, I think, but this is actually a really common problem where people will, will say, oh, I know, Sorek, that's Spock's father. And I'm like, no, actually, that's, that's Sorek. Um, I, I'm also not Torek. Um, that was an ensign on Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, I, I'm just, in general, I'm not from the planet Vulcan. <laughs> I, I, I apparently you have to say this. Somebody actually said that uh, already as I was, uh, as I was sitting up here. Um, you will note that that is not how you play a violin. Uh, this is actually the uh, very like this is the, the, the picture of me. Um, I, I actually do at least sort of know how to play a violin, um, but I'm not that good at it. But people talk to me all the time about playing violin. Uh, and, but most importantly, I am a computer hacker. And that's that's why I'm here. Um, I I'm kind of like. I, it's occasionally I kind of channel the stereotype of the computer hacker from the movie where I'm like sitting in the middle of the massive light show, you know, programming on something that's affecting people all over the world. This is actually what was happening behind me. This is just a few weeks ago in Vegas. Um, but most of the time, my job is almost not even development. My job is community management. So what I do is I travel around to conferences like this and I do outreach to users and developers explaining what it is that I do and why I think it's important. Um, so I... I've been doing this since two, early 2009. This is one of the, this is like the second talk that I gave, the previous one, a really small one, just a couple weeks earlier. Um, and, and that's what really brings me here today. So what is it that I do? I work on Cydia, which is the alternative to the App Store on jailbroken phones. So the App Store is, a, is, is something that, actually, actually, I should stop. How many here know about the App Store? Okay, great. I've been doing this so long that I sometimes I just like, do you know about the App Store? And they actually say no. And then I'm like, oh, okay. We'll see this. All right, so the App Store has got this issue that people like to talk about where applications get rejected from the App Store. And that's where everyone always looks at me and they say, oh, you solved that problem, right? So um, whether it be a web browser from Firefox, uh, whether it be a um, actually pornography application, whether it be anything that Apple doesn't want, Apple says no to it. And then people say, oh, you bring it to Cydia. So there's a quote I found on some webpage, um, once rejected, Talkin took its business elsewhere, offering the app up for the jailbroken gray market. So I actually, I, I, I always take issue with this characterization because I think this misses the whole point of what jailbreaking is and what Cydia is. So now let's go into that a little bit. Jailbreaking is about when there isn't an app for something. It's not about you made an app and then Apple rejected your app. Apple actually honestly has reasonable reasons a lot of times for rejecting applications. I mean, sometimes it, it's bothersome that they are using a single value system. Um, in the case of pornography, well, why is that actually like, such a serious problem? Why is Apple rejecting that? It's a problem that is a single legal basis. Um, you might be doing something that's totally legal in the Europe and Apple's like, well, I can't do that in the United States. Um, some things um, uh, involving um, uh, celebrities and portrayal of them, etc. And so you might be bothered with that. Um, but by and large, a lot of the stuff that Apple ends up rejecting is rejected due to quality. It's rejected due to the, um, the application just actually being a scam uh, and Apple's taking money, et cetera, for it. Um, what Cydia is primarily focusing on is all this stuff where you wouldn't have been able to deploy it to the App Store in the first place. There's no process by which you can give it to the App Store. Instead, I would say that we are a feature store. We're a place where you can go and instead of downloading a, an icon that represents a totally different world on your phone where you can go in and you can browse Facebook, you can browse LinkedIn, you can go and you can order pizza from somewhere. Uh, instead, maybe you'd like to get a change to the operating system, something that normally you'd have to wait for Apple to release a new version of iOS for. You can get it now. You can get it today. Maybe it's free. Maybe it's for pay. We're also not about free software. So, Winterboard. Uh, is an example where people will go through and they will change all of the graphics and icons on their phone. So in this case, we've got a custom icon theme where all of the uh, all of the icons have this cool transparent effect, which of course works really well with the with with the other right kind of wallpaper. Um, but you can also get new functionality. So uh, in my previous screenshot of the City of Store, we had a uh, five icon dock with something that you know was about to be installed. Well, here we've got five icons at the bottom instead of the normal four. Um, 
The functionality can get kind of crazy. This is something called barrel. So barrel is a uh, way of uh, doing transitions between pages on your phone. So when you've got your home screen, you've got all your icons, and you swipe left and you go to the next page, um, barrel ha will fade between the icons, or it will do a 3D rotate effect between all the icons. Maybe you swipe horizontally, but it moves them vertically. Um, my favorite effect is this one, which is the kind of the title effect. It's all of the icons manipulate themselves into a circle and roll off the screen. And then another uh, circle of icons rolls on the screen and then kind of expands back out and fills, and fills the grid again. But it's not just features that are in Apple's operating system. Uh, we also can have modifications to third-party applications. So here's a feature that somebody added to the uh, YouTube application called YourTube, which adds a download video button uh, right into the interface. Um, these kinds of modifications are, are something that then are just become very pervasive. You can do them to anything on the system. All right. So again, though, I mentioned that you know it's taking things that Apple would be doing at some point, and you can kind of get them now. Well, if we look at a lot of the features in iOS 8, these are features that you've actually been able to get from jailbroken devices now for a while. Third-party keyboards, quick reply for messages, renaming message threads, um, always on Siri, so that you don't have to like hit the button in order to get it to listen to you. Uh, embedded photo editing, supporting touch ID and applications. The people who work on these software modifications are at the forefront of innovation of what the features of the operating system will be. And you can actually imagine, I mean, Apple can use us as like a um, uh, testing ground. You can see what worked, what didn't, what was confusing, what wasn't. And you'll oftentimes see features that we've released a couple of years later ending up in Apple's operating system uh, in some interesting, refined manner. Um, sometimes it's not it's not as, as fully as like com complex or as full as the feature in Cydia, but in a way that's kind of a, the point is that they figure out how to target the complete end user experience on that. So the way we do all of this is using a technique called runtime code modification, um, which is something that I, I, I provide the features for in the community, um, a, a library and framework called Substrate, which is designed to make it both easy and safe and um, hopefully in a way where multiple developers don't step on each other and make these changes. In a way, my kind of inspiration for this is when I was a kid, I, I had a Game Genie. And I, how many of here, how many people here had a Game Genie? A lot of people had a Game Genie, or like a Game Shark, or um, there were a few other, a few, a few other variations of this. Game Genie was a device that connected into your Nintendo, and it sat between the cartridge and the game console. And it, it was actually kind of awkward because the, the way the Nintendo worked is you kind of slid the cartridge in and then you pressed it down into the machine, and there wasn't room for the Game Genie. So the machine, the, like, um, the cartridge would kind of still be sticking out of the machine and everything, but it provided an interface when you first turned on the console where you could configure it, and then the configuration would intercept um, the uh, download of the program code from the cartridge and change individual bytes of data that was stored on the cartridge as the device read it. It was a way where you could change the code of the program that you're about to run. Now, it's something where a lot of people even had a Game Genie, didn't really understand what it was doing or why it was doing that because there were these opaque codes that you typed in that were like, like six or eight digits long that were a bunch of letters. And there, but there was a, a scheme you could, you could um, decode them and you could figure out that that was actually change this address of code to this different byte of value. Uh, and that was, um, and that what that allowed you to do is to do anything from making Mario always invincible to never being able to die to having him swim through levels where he's not even underwater. Um, because you're, there's just all of the comparisons, all of the checks in the code, you're able to control all of them. Now, one thing I like to sometimes think about this is, in a way, it's kind of fan fiction for software, and that's actually the, the, the kind of the, the title concept of this talk, is that you have a developer who's constructed an application, and they have a vision of where they're going with it. You can actually think of it as the original canon for, the, for, for this like, universe of this, of this thought process, this application idea. And they are in control of how it gets released from release to release. And in, in a way, they're like they're the, the characters and the the, um, the features of the of the application of the product are things that only they're allowed to manipulate and control in the release process. Um, there are a lot of people, however, who would like to see something a little crazier. They would like to see um, features um, put in different ways that the original developer maybe was a little uncomfortable with. Um, and so some things like being able to download a YouTube video is an example of that. Somebody may be actually being uncomfortable with something. 
Um, or it could just be something that just didn't really make sense. I mean, some fan fiction doesn't always make sense. It doesn't have to make sense. It's something that the, the person who's writing, the person who's reading it enjoys. And so you might come up with a feature that sort of makes sense to you, but doesn't make sense to anyone else. And the original developer is never going to try to add this kind of feature. You might go even further, and you might start trying to do mashups between different features of different uh, different products, um, trying to blur between Touch ID and the um, uh, and the password authentication from Facebook. You might be trying to take functionality from Twitter and add it into another application. Um, it starts to look like remix culture, where you've got software and you've got a bunch of ideas floating around in all this software, and you as the person who's experiencing the software, you take all this software and you're kind of smashing it all together and changing it and making it yours. You're making it sound the way you want, you're making it, you're, you're taking the, um, the, the pieces of components and building something really awesome and cool out of it. So there's these interesting, like, well, it's interesting to me, these the interesting copyright ramifications that come out of some of these things. Um, now, but I'm actually... There's another analogy I want to use, which I never get to use, because I always say to people, have you heard of Stargate SG-1? And my audience are all like high school students and early college students, and they all say no. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I, I'm at the point where this is like, this is one of the, to me, this is a recent television show that is one of the, like, one of the last well-funded science fiction shows. And it's like, if you're interested in science fiction, how could you not have watched this show? But then they're like, no, I haven't seen this show. So... So in Stargate SG-1 also, of course, you know, the end sequel, Star Stargate Atlantis. I'm actually going to start there for a second. So the, the Atlantis gate was this really awesome thing, right? It, it's, it, it had this massive computer associated with it, and it was all designed by the people who designed the Stargate system. And they had all sorts of cool functionality in all sorts of systems. But it was only in Atlantis that they actually had this kind of gate. Everywhere else, there was this stupid normal gate. The normal gate didn't really do much. It allowed you to go from one place to another place using this thing called the dial home device. Um, which was a very easy system. It was an easy end-user interface, fast, automatic activation, but it had very limited functionality. You could dial a gate address, it would open a wormhole, you'd go there, everything else was fairly automatic. Um, the, this, this is a kind of, to me, feels very similar to the experience where you've got like an iPhone, and you talk to people at Apple, and they're like, oh, we do all sorts of really cool stuff. Oh, yeah, we, did, we, we had an emulator running on the iPhone long before uh, you guys even figure out how to hack it. It's like, yeah, well... The device you gave me didn't even run any games. I didn't even have Tetris or like Worms or, or Snake or whatever on it or anything. Um, but the thing that I always found exciting, I actually found Atlantis to be a little more boring, honestly, because I was always fascinated by the Earth Gate. The Earth Gate was somebody took a normal gate and then figured out how it worked. Spent the, the, the quote from the television show is they spent 15 years building a supercomputer, which whose goal was to power this gate. And we then have Walter. Instead of the DHD, Walter is our interface for manipulating the gate. He's a dedicated operator, and the uh, the gate itself has a slow manual activation process. I mean, literally, right? It's it's like it's an analogy to a rotary dialing a telephone as opposed to having a touch tone. Um, it has uh, it, it has a lot of advanced functionality, though. I mean, like, they're actually able to see what's going on inside of the gate as things are as the uh, wormholes are getting constructed. Um, they're able to use this in order to, for example, automate the process of constructing this massive um, metallic iris, which, of course, is just such a hack, right? I mean, it's like we we don't want things to go through the wormhole, and so we figure out a way to put this massive metal shield on it. So, such a hack. Kind of people who build these silly hacks are these crazy hacker types. So we're gonna shift gears again here. So, um, so let me say what well, my next slide is. Oh yeah, so these these crazy hacker types build all this stuff, and the kind of the attitude that we have going into constructing these kinds of things is a little bit awkward. And so this actually got brought up in the television show. Um, so. Uh, the gate wasn't meant to be used without a dialing device. This is Rodney McKay. Your computer system ignores 220 of the 400 feedback signals the gate can emit during any given dialing sequence. It is a fluke that you picked up the buffer warning. For that matter, I'm surprised you even bothered to abort the dialing sequence despite the error. It's this kind of like hacky attitude is something that you see of a lot of computer hackers, where we, like, we kind of get it to work. And you know, I saw the Earth gate is really cool for me because it has so much advanced functionality, but it's also really cool for me because it only just barely works. And all right, so in order to make all this kind of stuff happen, though, we end up we end up like we end up going in, and we end up ripping apart, understanding and manipulating. We end up tampering with a lot of systems, and so this is also why I have this quote here: "Is to say I'm surprised you even bothered to abort the dialing sequence despite the error." It's like there's there's this actually this kind of serious warning that the gate had um, that the computer system um, was that the normal the DHD would actually like control correctly and handle for and everything, but somebody kind of tampered with it and messed with the whole thing. Tampering is something that there are actually laws. Uh, 
against. So there's this, this is Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has an anti-tampering clause in it, which states that if you have copyrighted works um, that are protected by a, um, oh God, it's actually been so long since I said this word, so I'm blanking my head out, um, a, an effective, it's, it, they actually say it, an effective uh, uh, anti-tampering uh, device. And so you always question, like, was it really effective in the first place? Um, but it's, it, it, against an, an effective system that you aren't allowed to take that effective system and um, remove that, um, that protection from that copyrighted work. And the question then starts to become, well, if we're sitting around and doing all of this cool software, I mean, we're, what we're doing is, is we're trying to change the behavior of software. We're, we're not trying to steal software. We're not trying, to, we're not even really affecting Apple's business model, honestly, because we're not even competing with them on apps, things like that. Um, but in order to do that, we have to remove the mechanisms that are protecting Apple from things like piracy. We start falling under things like the anti-tampering clause. And this is why the Electronic Frontier Foundation is so kind enough to have me on a track like this, is that this is what they're constantly looking at, is um, issues in technology where the law is saying things that doesn't really seem to match the, the morals or values or even what we actually, um, um, our hopes uh, for, uh, of the user communities. And so the Electronic Frontier Foundation here, of course, defending rights and promoting freedom. They were working with, again, in the, the DMCA process, uh, every three years there's an exemption um, that you have to put forward. And so the exemption process is actually really irritating. So the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, when they put it out, it became very clear that, well, this is going to affect a lot of things we want to have. We want to have. Um, so uh, one of the like saddest examples of this is if you're blind and you want to be able to um, get a um, an audio interface of a of a book that you have on an e-reader. You should be able to you should be able to read the book. Uh, if the book is only come out in electronic format, I would like you to eventually be able to read that book. And in fact, the laws were set up in a way where that was considered a legitimate usage for something like this. Whereas now every every three years we have to go and we have to fight for exemptions again on things like allowing people to get audio recordings from books that have been distributed in electronic um, formats. Um, we have to get um, fair use for educators to be able to uh, um, utilize even the little 30 second clips they've always been supposed to be allowed to utilize um, in the course of their classes um, because those um, those are now distributed on DVDs and the DVDs have an encryption mechanism that has been effectively nothing since 2002 or something like that when uh, the, the uh, uh, DVD John figured out the way the encryption works, but um, it's it's still something where we have to keep going and asking, like, can we still have this exemption? And they say yes, and there's a ton of money and a ton of process that goes into doing this every three years. So the um, this was the 2012 hearings. I was actually at the 2012 DMCA hearings. I was in the audience, the picture that I took. Um, this is a lawyer from the EFF, Marsha Hoffman, who's um, sitting in the, um, she's in the, you can't even see this picture anyway, because it's such a faded out picture, but she's in the uh, gray suit over on the right of the picture. Um, okay, so I guess I was, I, these slides are a little bit order interesting. Um, so I was going to say then, uh, another example of where this is, of where you might have heard a lot about this, is with the PlayStation 3 hack from Fail Overflow. So the PlayStation 3 hack um, was a really popular, um, like, it was, a, it was a really, like, mainstreamed uh, case uh, involving the, uh, the DMCA and issues with that. Although, honestly, it never actually came to that. So we ended up having the actual Sony versus Geohot battle, and it was entirely a battle of jurisdiction. So we never actually managed to learn anything interesting about any of these laws or how they might affect anything. Um, the uh, Sony Online uh, of uh, California really wanted it to be Sony Online of California um, sues a uh, punk kid from Jersey, um, whereas uh, you know, Geohot really wanted it to be um, local hometown kid gets sued by massive Japanese mega conglomerate. Uh, and uh, in the massive battle that ended up consuming, um, pursuing, um, there were issues were brought up like, well, where was Geohot collecting PayPal donations from? Did he have a website where servers located in California? Were any of the people who gave him money located in California? It got to the point where the uh, uh, judge in charge of the case was, I'm really uncomfortable with the idea that anyone within anyone with a website who uses uh, an online mechanism for getting payments of any form suddenly has jurisdiction in my court. Um, but in the end, we didn't even learn that because uh, they settled out of court. And uh, we don't really have any clue, of course, what they settled for because um, that was also all, all covered up, et cetera. Um, but arguably more fun was there's actually, it, it kind of turned into this epic rap battle, right? Uh, I have, did anyone here actually see this video? No, you saw this video. So. Yo, it's Geohot. And for those that don't know, 
I'm getting sued by Sony. Let's take us out of the courtroom and into the streets. I'm a beast, at the least you'll face me in the Northeast. Uh, get my ire up, light my fire. I'll go harder than Eminem when at Mariah. Call me a liar, pound me in the ass with no loot chafe fan. You're fucking with the dude who got the keys to your safe fan. Those that can't do bring suits Cry to your Uncle Sam to settle disputes Thought you'd tackle this with a little more tact But then again, fudge packers, I don't know jack I shed a tear every time I think a lick sang But shit man, they're a corporation And I'm a personification of freedom for all You fill dockets like that's a constant foreign to y'all But lawyers muddy water and TRO stall Out of business is jail for me and you're suing me civilly Exhibit this in the courtroom Go on, do it, I dare you so the reason why I will say this actually turned into such a, such a horny issue is that the um, is piracy. So with the um, with the uh, with the case of something like a PlayStation, Sony sells a PlayStation below cost. Um, they they sell it they sell it in a, as a as a loss leader for actually getting games. So you'll then go and you'll go try to buy games, and the <laughs> games will have a royalty arrangement with with Sony in order to that you like if they, when every copy that EA sells, they have to give some percentage of revenue back to um, back to Sony. And if you try to take their hardware and you start doing a lot of stuff with it that doesn't require you to start going through either the game manufacturers anymore, because like the big ones that are that have licenses with Sony, because you're now you're able to deal with independence, or you're able to start stealing video games, which of course is a problem just in general for other business reasons, um, that that drastically affects Sony business model. I mean, you imagine the worst case scenario: everyone in the world buys a PlayStation. Like I'm actually not not kidding. Worst case scenario: everyone in the world buys a PlayStation because are they going to buy games with it? If not, Sony just lost you know hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, so. We've not had this kind of issue with Apple, where which is um, which is I think important to point out because Apple does not sell any of their hardware at a loss. Uh, Apple um, actually, if you look at like their App Store, um, they the amount of money that they make on a sale of an iPhone is a hundred times what they're making off of the number of apps that people are actually buying on those phones. So. And we actually got a good comment from the Copyright Office, Library of Congress. While joint creators raised concerns about pirated applications that are able to run on jailbroken devices, the record did not demonstrate any significant relationship between jailbreaking and piracy, which is kind of nice. So we did get an exemption. We got the exemption in 2009. It got renewed in 2012. But the exemption was for computer programs that enable wireless telephone handsets to execute software applications, where circumvention is accomplished for the sole purpose of enabling interoperability of such applications when they have been lawfully obtained with computer programs on the Telephone handset. So, Apple TV. Uh, our same tools for years worked on the Apple TV, um, but the Apple TV is certainly not a wireless telephone handset. Um, the Apple TV, however, also starts to run into the problem of um, are they actually selling this thing at, at, uh, at the right price? And the Apple TV is actually kind of an interesting one. Where, as far as we understand, they t um, they bin chips. So what, what that means is, is that when they make an iPhone, um, like the current, like really good version of the iPhone, like right now the iPhone 5S, um, not all of the chips work because um, sometimes when you're, when you're putting billions of transistors on something, some of them are broken. Uh, and so it's a dual core chip. If one of the cores doesn't work, they can't use it in an iPhone 5S, but they make the single core I, um, Apple TV out of a dual core iPhone 5S chip um, with one broken core that's turned off. Um, so it actually is, they, when you look at the price of some of these things, it's like, well, the price of this, this device is actually kind of cheap, and even though it looks like it's got, like, it's like it's the same as an iPod, but it's got like a bunch of extra connectors and a bunch of extra stuff on it, just it doesn't have the screen, well, screen expensive, et cetera, but it's actually because it's using broken parts. Um, so, but even, even the iPod Touch, and this is the one that really, really makes me sad, is that the iPod Touch isn't covered, because it's, I mean, it's not a wireless telephone handset. Um, the one, though, that gets a lot more press is that the iPad isn't covered. Uh, it's also, of course, not a wireless <laughs> telephone handset. I mean, even to some extent, you can, I mean, it has cellular connectivity in it. It's, it, it's not a handset, right? And so um, it's, it's something where well, maybe there's some arguments that can be made in court, et cetera, like that. But we really like to get an actual exemption on it. So I was at the, I was actually at, this is a 2012 hearing where one of the people who was on the Copyright Office panel, though, held up a Kindle, and he was just very upset about the idea that if we got an exemption for tablets, then we would also get an exception for Kindles. Now, I kind of feel like the Kindle should be exempt, because the Kindle to me is another computer, and I think that all these computers should be exempt. Um, but the, the business model argument is that this is a device that is only designed for providing um, ebooks, and that you know, Amazon can be given this away for free, right? Um, and that, um, again, we run into this kind of scenario where people are get, get unhappy, they get upset, um, and uh, maybe there will, 
imagine losses down the road, things like that, um, if you start targeting these things in, in too large quantities. Um, but the guy on the copyright panel was actually just, he was adamant that he didn't want to accept a definition of tablet that would also include a Kindle. The line gets so blurry. So here's the Amazon Kindle Fire, right? The Amazon Kindle Fire is essentially now an iPad. I mean, it's got all the app functionality. It's got the, it's got um, music videos. It's got, it's got a full color LCD screen. It's running Android. It's, it's a, it's a computer, right? But so now the question is, is that how are we going to succeed in figuring out ways of defining tablets such that the copyright office is actually going to be happy with this? Um, everyone is really puzzled about this, including here, Newt Gingrich. Uh, actually, he. He did a he did a like a little video that kind of went viral for a while, mostly making fun of him. But uh, I actually think that it's like people are saying that he, he doesn't like the fact that this is called a cell phone, and that I was actually kind of upset that people were making fun of him so much because the point that he was kind of getting at was that by defining this computer that is in our pockets that defines everything in our life, that stores all of your um, not just address book information but stores all of the communication you've ever had with any of those contacts. Um, that has all of these um, photographs you've taken, the video recordings, audio recordings, all of the stuff that's in your pocket. By defining it as a phone, we end up in really weird legal boundaries. I'm sorry, legal gray areas where um, police officers are allowed to look at things that are on your phone because they're trying to get what seems like some kind of more narrow piece of communication that you were doing. But now they've got access to your entire life. I mean, they're in essence like taking your brain apart. Um, we end up with laws that are defined around doing things with, with, with just this device um, and suddenly don't affect other devices. And so I think this kind of like figuring out how to define and how to name these devices, how we think about them as, as a user community, I think is actually a very important point. And I'm really glad that somebody like Newt Gingrich cares enough about it to have made a video and have taken a bunch of flack on the internet from a bunch of users um, in attempting to figure out what we're going to do about that situation. The way in which this issue is complex, though, I think is actually goes even further than what you normally hear. So now I'm going to take a second to talk about some of the ethical issues that are related to it. So going back to all these crazy hacker types. So this is a picture on the left of uh, Charlie Miller. Uh, in the upper right is uh, Geohot. Bottom right is Planet Bean, um, who, um, if you don't know him specifically, is, um, was um, uh, on the Evaders team, which did the jailbreaks for iOS uh, 6 and 7. Although, frankly, Planet Bean has effectively done all the jailbreaks since the beginning of time, except for the one that was done by uh, Comex. Um, and um, to some extent, Geohot, although he was often competing with Planet Bean. The person I'm going to focus on right now, though, is in fact Comex. So I'm going to talk about a specific jailbreak called Jailbreak Me. Um, jailbreak Me is one of the easiest jailbreaks that has ever existed, and it's kind of a name that's been passed down every time we manage to ba manage to come up with a jailbreak that works like this. It's a web page that you go to on your phone. So you go to the web page in, in, in the most elaborate version that has been made, which is the one that Comex did, Jailbreak Me 3, which is, I almost want to say is like his, his masterpiece, um, was a a website you went to that looked just like the App Store, and it worked just like the App Store. Only the thing that you were installing was Cydia. Uh, it had a little button that's free. You clicked on it, expanded to install. All we need to do is tap um, the free. We don't actually need to listen to that. You click on the free, it expands to install. These are my friends, by the way, who made this video, which is why I'm kind of. Um, click on install. And then the Safari closed. Like, the exploit didn't actually crash the browser. What he did is he took control of the browser, he closes the browser, and then he jumps from the browser into Springboard, and he starts the application installation animation sequence, having Cydia's icon fade in, having a progress bar below it, downloading a copy of Cydia from my website, and then having um, it get installed on the system in a way where when it's done, it's done. Uh, it doesn't actually require you to reboot. It doesn't require you to restart the um, anything. Um, he, he actually he, this was very complicated because he ended up um, there were a bunch of file system issues and really highly technical things that um, he spent months working on this. Um, to, to give a demonstration of just how crazy Comex is, at, at some point um, Apple fixed one of his bugs. They happened to find the bug, and so for a lot of us, it's like, well, that was the really hard part. That was like the devastating moment, right? Where now we have to give up and start over from scratch. But Comex was like, oh, they found my bug, and hours later. He came back and it's like, I've got another bug, I'm still going. We're like, what? <laughs> um, but the bug he used, uh, which is now what I'm going to focus on for a second, it was, it's a bug in the uh, hinting engine of the free type, true type font renderer. Okay, so fonts are the, are the way that you get glyphs for representing characters on your screen. They're, they have the different shapes of things like whether it be Arial, Times New Roman. Um, the font, when you look at it at really low resolution, looks horrible. Uh, and so you get this, this really blurry mess that's very difficult to read. Now, you can either spend a lot of time trying to figure out cute tricks in anti-aliasing. Um, and so one cute trick in anti-aliasing is taking advantage of the fact that if you zoom in really close on, a, on an LCD screen, it's not just 
color, color, color. It's always shade of red, shade of green, shade of blue, shade of red, shade of green, shade of blue. And if you put, if you, if you turn them all on, you get white. But if you turn off one of them on the edge and you turn on the one on the pixel over, you still get red, green, and blue all next to each other really close. And so you can kind of shift a pixel over by a third of a pixel. And so there are these really complicated algorithms that'll take something blurry like on the top and we'll try to construct something that has these like shades of red and blue in them that we see on the bottom that if you were to zoom out would actually look a lot crisper than the, um, than the original blurry one. But another type of algorithm you'll see is you'll see something called hinting where you'll take the, the, font, the font character glyph and you'll take a little hammer and chisel and you'll start kind of attacking it and you'll try to make it fit the pixel grid. Now, this might take a really beautiful font that has this wonderful curve, curved component that this did this tiny little serif piece at the end, and it'll make it look like this weird demented computer font from like the 1960s. Um, but it makes it readable, and that's what is like the primary concern a lot of people have when they're looking at the font. They don't care if it's, it's, it's pretty but blurry, I can't read it. It's like, well, it's, it's, read, it's readable, if that's what's important. This, this hinting algorithm um, can be font specific. Sometimes for certain kinds of fonts, there are things you want to preserve in the font that are more important than what might, like, than some heuristic might come up with. The way that that's specified is by embedding a computer program in the font that gets run in a virtual machine every time a character gets rendered. So that virtual machine turned out to have a bug in it, which allowed Comex to escape from that virtual machine into Safari's, like, like sandbox like actual machine, and then he had a bug in the sandbox, he was able to escape from sandbox into springboard, escaping into the kernel, and taking control of the entire system. This bug is a really cool bug, and this bug affects the iPhone, and it allows us to take control of the iPhone, manipulate all of its software, but it doesn't just happen on the iPhone. This is a bug in a program called FreeType. It's an open source implementation of the TrueType font specification that has an implementation of the hinting algorithm that is specified from TrueType. It is the same tool that is used in um, Foxit Reader. It's the same tool that's used if, if, if Firefox it has an embedded PDF thing, which I think it does. It's used in Firefox. Um, it's the same one that's used if you have a Linux machine and you are rendering fonts, you are using FreeType to render those fonts, unless they're really ugly. Um, if you uh, a lot of um, on a lot of uh, Apple um, like first-party Apple tools that you might have on your desktop Mac, I believe, including Preview, we're using uh, we're using free types sometimes. Not always. It depends on what exactly they were rendering. Apple also has their own font render. Um, this affected a lot of systems, so uh, there was a lot of collateral damage. So Comex, with the ethical system that he has, which I I totally respect for what it's, by the way I say that like I just want to make certain that like. Um, is that he's going to release a tool, like he's going to release an open source tool. And that's a lot of, a lot of like, hacker mentality is going to release an open source tool. And so he released an open source exploit um, about the same time. I think it was a little bit later. He didn't actually co-release. I, mean, I think he may have co-released one of them, but he didn't, uh, he didn't co-release uh, one of them, I think. Um, where you could just easily take what he did and construct a PDF, that, a PDF file that contained an embedded font file that contained an embedded hinting al um, algorithm that would do whatever it is you wanted to do. And so here's somebody who made one for Windows. And so this at the top is a bunch of code that will, if run on um, in, outside of a sandbox and arbitrarily on the system, will start the calculator app. That's like the default demo if you're a hacker and you want to demonstrate that you managed to take control of Windows as you start calculator. Um, <laughs> And at the bottom, we have a snippet of the code from it where, um, where it actually had a comment, created in, creating the PDF based on the Comex PDF, slightly modified. And he's got Comex PDF template, which was a constant up somewhere else that had the Comex's like, um, PDF file that he had all set up so to make it really easy to drop in whatever exploit you wanted. And now this, if you, run, if you just open this PDF file in Foxit Reader on a Windows computer, you've calculator spawns. So I therefore, I, I sit up here always and I talk about how jailbreaking is this really cool thing where we're going to go and we're going to make modifications to all the software, we're going to change the way all the icons work, we're going to add features and things, we're going to give you stuff that Apple won't give you in for a year or two from now. But in a way, jailbreaking is the process of weaponizing exploits as zero-day vulnerabilities, so users might do all of that stuff. It, it's taking a, a, a mistake in code that was designed to make you more secure. It's figuring out how that, mis that mistake exists. It's figuring out how that mistake works. It's figuring out how to control that mistake. And it's keeping that mistake secret from everyone who might either be able to fix it or might be, might be uh, harmed by it. And then utilizing that mistake uh, in a massive public manner so that some users might have this cool opportunity to make all their icons transparent. 
it's 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 a complex and eth- like it's a complex and thorny ethical issue, and it's something where different people have different opinions on it. Um, so there are people, for example, who are really strongly backing responsible disclosure. Um, there's a person named Jeff Forrestal, um, who actually I work with, and, and we we have very opposite ethics on this in a way, but you know, but it's it's like he respects what I'm doing, and I respect what he's doing. Um, where you'll find bugs, and you'll instead you'll bring them to the vendor. You'll go to Google, and you'll say, "I found a bug. I found this master key vulnerability." That's what Jeff Forrestal found last year. And then you'll give them time to fix the vulnerability, which, of course, because it's Google, they didn't do. Um, and then you'll, at only months later, will you publicly disclose the vulnerability after it has been after it has been essentially fixed? Um, uh, and Samsung had gone a bunch of fixes. He gave them a timeline that he was going to be. It was many months later. He was going to give a talking black hat. Um, so. That's clearly the opposite of what we're doing. So it's like that's responsible disclosure. What are we doing? Irresponsible disclosure? Well, I will argue that there's there's a different kind of ethics involved here that are important to think about. So when I look at jailbreaking, I think of I think of I think of children in a weird way. So and uh, this title, by the way, is the way that I was supposed to cite this picture. And I I, I both I, I had to find a picture that I could actually utilize in this context because it's the kind of thing where it's it's really like stock photo photography and everything. And so this is actually a public domain picture that I thought was just it was a really awesome picture, but it also <coughs> arguably had this really humorous title associated with it. But I had to put it on the slide. Um, I learned to program way back. I was in the second grade uh, at my at my elementary school, and I, I did it on an Apple II C, um, which had which was running uh, Logo, which was a programming language that has some influences from Lisp and some other programming languages. Um, but it, it's a language that a lot has like a little fountain pen that can be found ten, like pen down, pen up, and you can change the color of the pen and you can move the fountain pen tip around. Um, we had a robotic turtle that came with it that the school had that you could attach to the computer and that would hold a little marker and would move around. And instead of just having like a virtual spirograph, if you ever play with one of those things, the little marker that moves around, we actually had like a physical one we could control. And this was just the most awesome thing and it really inspired me to do computer programming. But honestly, I didn't because I didn't have the ability to really do this much at home. In fact, my parents even, they, 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 were really, they were excited for me. They wanted to support me. They got me an Apple IIe and I kind of played with it for a long time. But I didn't really feel like I became a computer programmer until I got this calculator. This calculator was was like required equipment for students in uh, when I was back in like seventh grade or something like that, uh, maybe even sixth grade, and it was something that I continued to have. This calculator or calculators very similar to it. Uh, in fact, students these days still have calculators very similar to this. Which is always one of the confusing things that happened. The calculator's gotten better. Why is my iPhone so much more powerful than my calculator that I'm still paying two hundred dollars for? Um, but. This calculator was programmable, and it was programmable in a language called TI Basic, and it came with a giant manual explaining exactly how TI Basic works, and it was, that was awesome. And it wasn't just so you could write programs sort of for yourself; you could write programs, and then you can you could plug a cable into your fu- um, into your um, what is it called calculator? You could plug a cable into your calculator, plug that cable into somebody else's calculator, and you could transfer your program from one calculator to the other one. So people would go and they would write games, and they would share games with each other. They would write things to help you with math homework, which sometimes math teachers didn't really like. Um, but then, then they would share those applications around. It was it, it's it's an opportunity where a lot of kids, including myself, really got into computer programming and for the first time because it wasn't just computer programming even for us; it was computer programming for us and our audience of friends. And I will argue that today it's the iPod Touch. So the iPod Touch is a very cheap device that is in essence a gaming device um, for, for a lot of the ways that, that parents think about it. Um, it is also a productivity device, um, but it is not a phone, which is something that a lot of parents like. Um, they don't want to give their kid a cell phone, but they will give their kid an iPod Touch. It plays music and it has all these games and all this other sorts of stuff. Um, it may be that they then feel like maybe I don't have to give them a DS or something like that. Um, the iPod Touch is also very cheap and the iPod Touch is nearly indestructible. Uh, and the iPod Touch is essential uh, is is oftentimes a giveaway, a throw-in with other things you'll get. Um, so you'll buy a new MacBook Pro, and it'll come with an iPod Touch, and you'll be like, "Okay, what am I going to do with this iPod Touch?" Well, I don't really need an iPod Touch, and you'll give it to your kid. Um, sometimes kids will get the hand-me-downs of the previous generation that the parent had. This is now, in these days, the computer that the child actually owns. And again, I call it a computer because to me, this is a computer. This is something that is every bit as programmable as my actual computer. And in fact, it's running an operating system that is nearly identical to my actual computer. Um, if you actually go and you start taking apart iOS, you realize that it is OS X. It's using the same surface compositing, font rendering. It's got all the same low-level um, programming uh, um, infrastructure as far as the um, way the standard libraries work, everything. I mean, you can, I mean, just, I drop an SSH server on here, and I'm able to SSH into it and treat it like a, 
um, a uh, like just like I treat my server. In fact, one day I was logged into my iPhone. I wanted to reboot it. I typed reboot. My phone didn't reboot, and I sat there for a little while, scratching my head until I realized I just rebooted my server. Because <laughs> I, I set them up the same. I mean, the shell, the prompts even looked very similar. They just had a different like this coloring and everything. So. So when I look at these devices and I think about the fact that they are kind of being controlled by, uh, by, by Apple, they're being centrally controlled by a certificate ch authority chain where in order to actually deploy software to it, you have to um, uh, sign paperwork, you have to often pay money um, in order to get, like it's $100 in order to get a certificate that allows you to actually code for the device. You can only use that certificate for one year. Uh, it's something where I I'm just looking and I'm seeing that this current generation of computers that ch children have aren't programmable in the same way that my calculator was, uh, in the same way that these, that, that I grew up learning to program. And it really makes me sad. And that's why, to me, there's, there's, it's not clear when you look at the responsible disclosure angle. I almost want to say that sometimes responsible disclosure is an unethical disclosure if you're, if you're disclosing things that are removing the ability for our next generation of developers in order to actually learn to develop. So, we're going into another DMCA exemption cycle in 2015. So every three years, um, these exemption cycles come up. And the question now again is, is are we going to be able to expand our exemption? Are we going to be able to keep our exemption? <laughs> I kind of hope we're going to be able to keep our exemption because we've already gotten it a couple times in a row. And they seem like a, just, they, if you read the comments, the comments actually loved the exemption last year. But we got no expansions. We're going to try again for tablets. How are tablets going to be defined? I would really love to try again for computers. Um, there was a um, group last year, the um, Software Freedom Law Foundation. Um, I probably got one of those words wrong, but it's the uh, legal group that backs the Free Software Foundation. Um, they, they tried for computers. Um, I don't really honestly, though, have much hope that we'll actually succeed in something like that. But I think that it can be helped a lot if people like you leave comments. So the way that the process works is that there's an opportunity for um, people to submit uh, things to become exempt. And typically, this ends up getting done by uh, law firms or um, uh, law affiliate groups um, that put together um, or yeah, well, they put together these um, fairly thick documents that try to make arguments both from legal and from economical standpoints about why certain exemptions should exist. Um, but there's um, then there's an opportunity for uh, res um, response, and then there's this opportunity where uh, just everyone in the general public is able to file comments. Last year, we got hundreds of comments from people in just users who wrote impassioned documents that then there's somebody who actually whose job it is to go through all these at the Library of Congress, and um, my understanding from talking to people from the EFS is that these comments really make the difference. So. Um, I would like to ask you all to please, when this comes up, to write comments. And I gave a talk last week where I happened to mention this as a, uh, as a call to action at the end. I usually I really suck at call to actions, by the way, so I was really happy to even have a call to action at all. And he said this is kind of a useless call to action because I can't leave the comment right now. And I'm going to forget to leave the, to do the, um, to file the comment when it actually comes up. So maybe there's some kind of like mailing list you could have me sign up for that I could just like send an email, like get an email from you, because he's talking to me, right, um, where um, when the call to action occurs. So I set one up quickly. If you go to groups.sorkit.com, this is like an official Google group thing, so you know that I'm not, I don't even think I, I can get your email address. Um, and uh, all of the subscription and mechanisms for it are, um, are like controlled by Google. Um, and if you go there and you click on browse, there's like one mailing list that's listed there, call to action, and you can go and you can, and again, it, it's, the, it's the normal Google groups interface. It just has this URL because I use um, Google apps to manage everything. Um, any questions? Comment, you're awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, to repeat the comment, he said that I was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.